And it came to pass, after these things, that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abram rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and cleared the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went into the place of which God told Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place far off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again. And Abram took the wood of the burnt offering, and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand, and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abram his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abram said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told them of. And Abram built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abram stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abram lifted up his eyes, and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by its horn. And Abram went and took the ram, and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abram called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, In the mouth of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called to Abram out of heaven the second time. And he said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemy, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abram returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milchai, she hath also borne children unto thy brother Nahor, Huz his firstborn, and Buzz his brother, and Kimuel the father of Aram, and Jesed, and Hazoi, and Pildash, and Jid Jidlaf, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begat Rebekah. These eight Milchai did bear to Nahor, Abraham's brother. And his concubine, whose name was Riyama, she bare also Teba, and Gaham, and the Hashemakah. Okay, the Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you that we're able to read your word. I pray that we would not be ungrate, ungrateful for these things you've given us in your holy preserved word of God. And I pray that we would take time to read it every day like we're supposed to and not neglect grow spiritually new. I pray that you don't know there's a lot of difficult names in the Bible. Take time to learn how to say them and not be a sponsor of that place. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. Abraham finally got his son. Last week we saw how his son by Hagar was making fun of Isaac and so forth. And then we heard how Sarah says Hagar's son is not going to be the son, not going to inherit anything with my son. He's not going to be your heir and you need to cast him out. And we saw how Paul talked about on the side of faith, that was about how uh, those who are after the flesh will not receive the promises of God. The children of Israel have to be both of the flesh. Isaac was both flesh and of the spirit. And the reason why he received the promises of inheritance was because he was also uh, the promised child of the flesh. So a lot of times people say uh, we need to please and serve the lost Jew and placate them because they're God's chosen people. Well, the thing is that Ishmael was of Abraham, but he was not of Sarah. And the important thing is that those Jews, in order to receive their inheritance, their promise, they need to be saved. They need to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Otherwise, the promises are null and void to them. They're cast out. Even though they may have a kingdom, Ishmael was promised of God an earthly kingdom, they would not receive the inheritance. And also we saw that they received the token of their inheritance promises, that we also see that even though the servants and so forth were not inheriting, it was Isaac who the promises were to be received and the inheritance was to be given, even though the promises were about him, all everybody of his household received the token of that inheritance. And so we see we were blessed through the promise. Even if we are not physically of that seed, we are also received blessings of it. Even Ishmael received the token of that inheritance, but because he was not of the promise, he did not receive it. Through faith, we understand you need to have faith in the promise seed in order to receive it. It doesn't matter if you have the tokens of that inheritance. If you don't have faith in the promise seed, if you don't have joy in the promised seed, if you mock the promised seed, if, if you might be part of a church but the, and then you were baptized and all these things, but you don't live as if you were, say, per 
person if you don't are not part of it then it doesn't matter if you have the tokens you get cast out that's not saying that the Ishmael was not saved or Ishmael is going to hell now it's talking about how Ishmael did not receive the promises because of faith nevertheless he received a nation because he was part of Abraham that's not something we're going to work out yet right now but it's interesting the dynamics of faith is the fact that as far as inheriting the land the promises the physical promises you had that were promised to Abraham that nation had to go through Isaac it could not go through Ishmael so that's something to keep in mind for later as we see here Abraham has finally received the promises that God said through Isaac you're going to have all these inheritances through Isaac that your name will be called it was in Isaac that his seed would be called and so he understands that the promises God gave to him will be through Isaac and he made plea you know, made Ishmael live before thee and so forth but then he says no in Isaac shall thy seed be called when the people who live after Ishmael they kind of refer to Abraham as their father but they also refer to Ishmael as their father and so it's not the same nation it, they don't receive the same promises it's a different nation and so moving, moving that on through today is that oftentimes you see people called Jews claim to be children of God but yet they don't follow after God in the way that God claimed for them to do so and those people are not true children of God they have to be coming through the promise and they are not saved unless they receive the child of the promise and we see here in chapter 22 it came to pass are these things after the things that happened in the last chapter that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him Abraham he said behold here I am that's a good thing to have as a Christian is when God calls to you you say here I am but we see that a lot of times in the Bible is that when a prophet of God like Jeremiah Isaiah and Samuel is that whenever they heard like Samuel he says Samuel Samuel and then he's like who called me who called me and then told hey when you hear the voice all you have to do is say here I am Lord so that's the thing it's like when you hear the voice of the Lord rather than trying to figure out who called you say here I am and, and then you'll hear from the Lord and he said take now thy son thine only son Isaac whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him up there a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of now here is an interesting thing is that he says thine only son Isaac Ishmael was of his seed he was after him but he was not after Sarah so as far as God cared as far as God regards even the first two times in the Bible which I think is interesting the first two times angels ever appear in the Bible aside from Abraham but at that time all he knew was that they were men going to Sodom and Gomorrah and so he found out that they were angels but before that it was Hagar God sent angels twice to Hagar in regards to Ishmael because Ishmael was his son the seed of Abraham and yet here we see the fact that God says take now thy son thine only son he's the only son of faith the only son of promise God never promised Ishmael and Ishmael even though he was considered by God a son of Abraham he was not considered his only son and so it's kind of interesting that God has many sons but he only has one son only one begotten son and so that is comparison here is that in spite of Abraham's faults he's going to use Isaac and Abraham as a symbol as a picture of himself and his own son is that even though we are all adopted children of God there is only one begotten son that's Jesus Christ and we see here that God is setting up Abraham in this testing in this trial in order to make him understand in faith what he's going to do in the future the Savior would be crucified and this is how prophecy works if we look back on the Old Testament we see how God worked in faith through their lives and then we can look for the picture that God was trying to present in the Old Testament here in particular of how his own son Jesus Christ would die for the sins of the whole world we're going to see that picture here they could have prophesied from Abraham all the way up to the time of Jesus Christ with John the Baptist and they could say this is how that God himself would pay for the penalty of our own sin and also through the sacrifices and so that's what he's setting up here these things that God did tempt Abraham said unto him Abraham he said here am I and he said take now thy son thine only son Isaac whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of Moriah. Now Moriah here at this time is the temple mount but at this time it's just a mountain. No temple there. There's no city there. There's nothing there. It's just called Mount Moriah and that temple mount will be eventually where Jerusalem is built where the temple is built and so forth and so he's setting up this particular location. We know from Abraham onward that people know Mount Moriah as the place where Jesus Christ is going to be sacrificed in the future when the Messiah will be cut off, pay for the sins of his people.
people will be in Mount Moriah. They know this. This is what Paul is referring back to in the New Testament. To land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So this is now just a haphazard thing that Abraham just woke up one day and said, I think God wants me to sacrifice Isaac. This is something to where God is specifically telling him, hey, this is the sequence of events that I want you to do. I want you to go from where you are now. Not just wake up one morning and say, I'm going to sacrifice Isaac outside of my tent for God. But rather, he says, I want you to take him and I want you to go someplace. I want you to go to this specific spot. The reason being is this specific spot, of course, is where Jesus Christ is specifically going to be crucified later on. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. And then in the land of Moriah, I will tell thee of. And then verse 3, is it him going off to Sarah and saying, woe is me, this is what God wants me to do. Or is this going off to one of his men and going around the, the well coolery? He's like, man, I, this morning God just told me to do this crazy thing. Do you think I should be doing this? It's something that God was very specific about. It wasn't something that he needed to get counsel or advice from. God has been preparing him, preparing his life to understand that Isaac will be the promised seed and that his progenitors will come from Isaac and that he will make a nation out of Isaac. So he rose up early in the morning. He didn't wait around. He didn't piddle paddle. He, he knew what God wanted him to do. So he rose up early in the morning. He, as soon as he heard of God from this thing, that he got up and was ready to go. Now, obviously, when God talks to you like that, you can't really sleep. Oh, wonderful. God just talked to me and, and now I'm going to go to sleep for about eight hours. Oh, um, it's not that way. When you hear from God, you can't really sleep. If you've ever had an experience like that when God spoke to you, not maybe audibly or something like that, but he, he inspired you with advice or understanding at a certain amount of time at night, then you're like, wow, I can't believe that. Or you, some truth was revealed to you, and then you just can't sleep. It doesn't even have to be biblical necessarily. It's just something that you were inspired with, maybe for work, maybe for some project or, or something. You're, just, you're about ready to go to sleep you're sleeping just fine then you wake up in the middle of the night and say wow God just revealed to me something that I've been praying about concerned about thinking about and then this is the answer now I can't go back to sleep because I want to implement it I want to put it into action and so this is kind of where he is in faith now uh, previously he's told of God I want you to go to the land where I'll show you and then he piddle paddles in Haran and he delays and then he can't stay there anymore and, and his faith takes him down to provide for himself in Egypt and then he goes back up with baggage and so forth. But now, after a hundred years, that kind of gives me encouragement. After a hundred years, now he's figuring this thing out. Sometimes it takes us a while. What, what am I, 32 now? So I got 70 plus years to go before I figure this thing out. That's kind of how faith works sometimes. It doesn't work all at once. You'll eventually get there. It's, it happens at different stages for different people. When Moses was 40 years old, he tried to save the children of Israel by his might. Play the Egyptian. He thought he would free them. But then it was the wrong time. He was doing it in the wrong way and he had to flee for 40 years and it took him 40 years to figure out how God wanted him to do it and then it took another 40 and then by the time he was 120 he still didn't do it right because he whacked the rock too many times and God forbade him to go into the promised land after 120 years of this thing he saw it afar off but didn't receive it and so sometimes it takes us quite a while to get it right just because we don't get it all right all at once doesn't mean we should lose heart it means that we should just keep working on it because there's a process of time that God wants us to have. And here, after 100 years, now he's up to this time. And now finally, instead of dilly-daddling, he got up and rose up early. That's something we can learn right away is when God tells us to do something, rise up early and do it. Now, obviously, there's situations where you should get counsel and situations that aren't very clear. But when it's obviously clear, when it's obviously when God comes to you in a vision or audibly or, or visibly and says, hey, you know, this is what you need to do. And your past life experience and faith has has proven time and again that's what it should be, then there's no reason to dilly-dally. you, you got to go. you got to do it. He rose up early and he prepared the things. He took two of his young men and he took Isaac his son and he claimed the wood for the burnt offering. He rose up and went into the place which God had told him. And so we see here that he prepared all this stuff himself. He didn't send off for some mail-order wood catalog. He knew what God wanted him to do it, so he did it himself. We as a church know what God wants us to do, has to do the Great Commission, so we need to go out and do it. It's 
it's not that, oh, we need the Great Commission, so let's just sit in our chairs, send off a check somewhere from some guy on the TV and send it off somewhere to do the Great Commission, and then we'll just sit around and work and get money so we can send it off. No, we got to go out and do it ourselves. So that's the whole point of the church is that we organize to do it ourselves. Together, go out and do the Great Commission. He rose up and he clays the wood and so forth. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. On the third day. It's a three days journey to get there. It's also a symbol of the third day the sacrifice was made. Our Savior rose on the third day after the sacrifice. That's why some say, what day did Christ get crucified? Well, on Wednesday because that's the third day. But I don't know if that's entirely accurate to, to go off that. Third day, you know, one, two, three. Abraham took the lad of the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in, in hand and a knife, and they went, both of them together. He took the wood and he took the knife. You know, oh, I forgot the knife. We can't have the sacrifice, God. He made sure that he had all the tools he needed for the sacrifice. He knew exactly what God wanted him to do, and so he prepared all the tools that he would need for the project. When we are following the Lord in faith, we don't just leave something at home. We don't just say, well, I can't do your project now, Lord, because I forgot to go to Bible college, or I forgot to do this, or I forgot to work in the church and do a ministry. When God calls you in faith, he knows you have the tools to do it, and you just need to get those tools and use it. And sometimes we try to add tools or take away tools, but in reality, when God tells you to do it in the process of time, you have the tools available to you. You just need to take them with you. We need to, to take the tools that God is giving us. Every part of our life is a tool in that aspect of that He is preparing us. But I'd like to point out that in this immediate response of faith in getting all these things, Abraham, he rose up early. He, even though he didn't understand the process, he knew what God wanted him to do. Sometimes, even if he didn't feel like doing it, it's like not like Abraham felt like sacrificing his son, but he knew what he had to do in faith. And so sometimes things in faith aren't really things you are comfortable with or have necessarily have peace about. Sometimes we say, well, I know it's the will of God because I have peace about it or I'm comfortable with doing it. We always give these excuses or fully understand it now so now I can do it. But the thing is when we do things in faith, we don't always know the ins and outs of stuff. We don't always know exactly how we're supposed to do it. All we know is that God told us to do something and we just need to do it with the tools that we have at hand. But the problem is a lot of times people say, well, I know what God wants me to do, but until I get full understanding and knowledge of the whole process, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to start it. I'm not going to uh, be part of it until I fully know how to do it. The thing is that we're never always going to be prepared to do something until we are at that point God wants us to do it. And it's kind of like witnessing and gospel preaching and so forth and running a church is like sometimes you want to know the whole process before you start it or when you go out. It's nice to have an outline before you go to a door. You want to say, well, this morning God told me to go knock on somebody's door and talk to them about the gospel and salvation. Knock, knock, knock. Hey, have you heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ? No. Uh, okay, well, well, he saved us, and so you should be saved too. Well, how do I do that? Well, I don't know. You should know the process of going and, and directing somebody through salvation before you get to the door and knock on there, but that doesn't mean that you have to go through 30,000 trial runs to figure it out. You do it, and you'll learn how to do it. And you just get a basic outline, and then you start knocking on doors. You'll learn what works, what don't, but you won't know it until you actually do it. And, and so that's the important thing is that in faith, we do it when God tells us to do it with the things at hand, even if we don't completely understand or completely feel like doing it. Not everybody is comfortable with knocking on a door and talking to a complete stranger. Neither are they, but it's something that we know in part of the Great Commission that we should knock on every door and tell every person. So even if we're not comfortable doing it, we walk by faith, not our feelings or our comfort level. That's the difficult thing for me, especially, is to be able to know what I need to do in faith, but then getting my feelings out of the way to be able to do them. We see that he got all the products and he saddled up. He did all these things personally. He got everything ready. He told his men and then he went into the place where God had told him. And so he didn't know exactly how he was to do everything, but then he went to the place which God had told him. He got all the stuff that he knew God wanted for a burnt offering and then he got there and he went to the place. He went to the right spot. He went directly there without delaying or faltering or going there. And then on the third day it came to, came to Mount Moriah, which is modern day Jerusalem, which you can see that in Second Chronicles chapter 3 verse 1 says then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite and so we see there this is the same spot this is an important spot this is where God wants him to be because he's a symbol of the sacrifice of God and then verse 5 it says I and the lad will go up yonder and worship this is the first 
word of the use of the word worship in the Bible. You got on all its way up to this point without actually worshiping, but then when we get to the cross, when we get to the place where the temple's going to be, we see the word first used, worship. We're going to worship the Lord here. I'm reminded of when Jesus Christ came to the well, uh, the lady at the well, she says, you Jews worship in the temple mount, and we worship up over in this mountain. And then Jesus says, time is coming, yet it is, you will neither worship him on the mount or in your mountain, but you'll worship him in spirit and truth, basically wherever you are. So that's quite interesting, but at this time, he wanted them to worship in reference to this area. The symbolism is important because the only person, only man we worship on earth is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. We don't worship any other man. We don't worship some cult leader. We don't worship Billy Graham. We don't worship Spurgeon. We don't worship any Calvin or anybody. We worship Jesus Christ, receive lessons from Jesus Christ. Christ, not lessons from other people. <coughs> worship it also means to bow down, by the way. It doesn't mean to I lift my hands up and worship. It's bowing down before the Lord. It's humbling yourself. Worship is not lifting yourself up in the spirit or anything like that. Worship is bowing yourself down before Jesus Christ, humbling yourself in a humble way. So when we sing our songs, we're singing songs of praise, and the praise and worship is where we praise Christ and God, and we humble ourselves. And that is the mode of the Christian is to lift God up and then humble ourselves. He must increase, but I must decrease. And so that's the purpose of our praise and our worship is to praise him and humble ourselves. So he says, wait here. And I'll come again unto you. Abraham was full of faith when he spoke of the young men who were with him. He believed that Abraham and Isaac would come back. His faith was in the knowledge that if he killed Isaac, God would raise him from the dead because God had promised Isaac would carry on the line of the blessing of the covenant. And so we see here in Genesis chapter chapter 21 verse 12 it says in Isaac shall thy seed be called and so we understand that what Abraham was told by God was that your seed would be called in Isaac if Isaac doesn't have any children and he's to be a sacrifice what is Abraham to think well this is a lie this is a contradiction no but faith says and a lot of times this is what we see is that people that don't have faith they look at something in the Bible and say that's a lie that's a contradiction because it contradicts this over here and this other passage because how can you have somebody be in the seed and then kill him at the same time. The thing is, though, faith says, in Isaac shall thy seed be called is true, and Abraham is asked to kill Isaac as a burnt sacrifice to God is also true. Faith says all the word is true, we just need to figure out how it works together. And in fact, it really doesn't matter how it works together because both are true. And so a lot of times when you read your Bible, when you read scripture, faith says all of it is true. I may not understand it all, but all of it is true. This may be some weird contradiction some pagan pointed out, but the fact remains is that pagan is not the arbiter of truth. It is the Holy Ghost within us. We don't ask the pagan, oh, you found a contradiction in the Bible? The metal pot is supposed to be 350 square inches around instead of 480 like this passage says and that passage says? Oh no, uh, my faith is ruined about the inches of the, of the metal bowl in the Bible. Oh no, woe is me. No, no. That's how non-believers work. They try to find a contradiction. They ignore the fact, of course, that the metal bowl is three inches thickness and then the outside is one size and the inside is another and then they point out this contradiction and the thing is that the devil works in deception he tries to make things look like contradictions but faith can resolve those because we see it in truth so a lot of things when pointed out as contradictions are true and so we see even though he knew that his seed would be called an Isaac and that he would be sacrificing his son on the temple he says that's what I'm called to do at this time is to sacrifice my son my only son Isaac to where my seed would be called an Isaac that I know that God will raise up Isaac. See, this is the important thing also is that the reason why Ishmael needs to be cast out because otherwise in thy seed Isaac shall be called and then if Ishmael is still with Abraham and God gives him this command to sacrifice his son Isaac, well, I guess this isn't true. I guess God changed his mind. Maybe now it's going to be Ishmael. May Ishmael live before thee. But in reality, he cast out the Ishmael and now he has faith that it is going to be Isaac and not Ishmael and so therefore he he knows that God can do something here that he's never done before, which is raise somebody from the dead. And we see this is the, what he believed, because in Isaac he'd yet to have children. He, God had to let him live at least long enough to have children. And we know this is the case because in Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter, we see the faith of Abraham. Uh, he says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 through 19, he says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises of the offering upon his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall
shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence he received from him in a figure. So we know in faith, Abraham believed that God would raise him up from the dead. That's why he was comfortable in faith doing this. It wasn't like he was some crazy nut who says, oh, I've got to kill my son. No, he says, God wants to show me something here. And I know even if I physically kill him, God can raise him up. And so this is the important thing to understand that Abraham was not planning on having an internally dead son. He knew that it would be a temporary thing for a symbol, for a sign of his faith to God and that he would be risen again. And so that's important to realize that Abraham was not being this crazy nut that was going to kill his son, but rather he was going to allow his son's body to die so that it can be risen again. And so it's important to realize that he's not some crazy, crazy person trying to do a crazy thing that, oops, oh, by the way, God happened to save us, you know? No, it was something he was doing in faith. He knew anything was possible, but it was impossible that God would break his promise. Now, it's more easier for God to raise somebody from the dead than to break his promise to us. And this is important what his faith, he realized that God cannot break his promises. He knew that God was not a liar. He had no president. No one in the Bible had yet been raised from the dead, but Abraham knew God was able to do it and could do it. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid upon his son Isaac, and Isaac carried it for his own sacrifice, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And so this is something that they did together. When God and Jesus Christ, the same God, one in, in heaven, the Father, and one in the flesh, the same God, that same Spirit, came to the cross. They were one. In John chapter 16, 17, it says, I and my Father are one. They are one. They go in common. It wasn't like God the Father says, okay, God the Son, I'm going to sacrifice you. And God's Son's like, no, I don't want to do it. It's like an unwilling sacrifice. The thing is that they both went together. Isaac trusted his father and Abraham trusted God. And this is the same way we do. We trust Christ and Christ trusts God. And the same way with our families. The kids, you trust your parent. The wife is to trust their husband. And the husband is to trust Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus Christ trusts in God. That we all go together. We do it together. We do it together in faith. This time Abraham didn't know how God would provide a lamb. See, so in verse 6 and 7, Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now Isaac is asking, Hey, I know we're going together to provide a burnt offering to the Lord and to worship the Lord, but where is the burnt offering? I'm not sure he's going to be the sacrifice just yet. Uh, and Abraham said, My son, God will provide, I like this, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So we see that God provides himself a lamb. And so this is important in Christianity to understand that not just anybody was to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, but rather it was going to be God himself that was to do it. So God himself is to provide. And so in this symbol, in this picture, God provides a ram, but in our understanding of faith and in our understanding of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, and God provided himself a lamb to take away the sins of the world. And this is very important, is that not anyone can take away the sins of the world because we are all condemned in sin. It is all something that we all do except for Jesus Christ because he was God. And he cannot sin. God cannot sin against himself. It's impossible. So he says God will provide himself for a lamb. So they went both of them together. So Isaac understands that God will be providing a lamb and then Abraham knows that God will be providing a lamb. He just believes that Isaac will probably be that image. And Abraham said my son God will provide himself and then verse 9 he came into the place where God had told him of and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him upon the altar of wood. Would you like to be in an altar of wood? No. Would you like to get burnt up? No, it's not, not a very fun thing to do, right? It's not something that anybody would typically want to do, but the thing is that they knew they were acting out something in faith. They knew that they were going to do something that would be witness to all people. It is something that they did together by themselves. And so he came to the place where God had told him. He built an altar of wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar upon the wood, just like he would do a burnt offering and sacrifice. Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So we see in this picture that, that God slayed his own son. God slayed himself on that altar for us. But here we see that there's a sparing. The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. You don't just keep on going. When God calls you, you got to stop and listen. Uh, that's the important thing to do. Well, I got to do, God, hold on a second. I got to do something that you told me to do. I'm going to do it right now. Okay, go ahead now. 
no. When we hear the Lord calling, we stop and do it. Sometimes we think we're supposed to go a direction. We continue on that direction until we get there. And now we're in the place that God wants us and we think we need to do a certain specific thing there that we were told before to do. But then we're about ready to do it. Now God calls us and says, okay, this is what I want you to do. So sometimes he wants us to get in certain situations, certain is thinking in a certain way. But then when we get in that spot, he reveals something more to us. And so it's important when we get to a certain spot to always be in tune to hearing the word of God. We don't want to keep on doing what we thought we were supposed to be doing. We've got to stop and hear at each stage of the process. And this is the thing is Abraham, he really didn't want to kill his son. I, I'm pretty sure he didn't, but he knew that if he did, this is what would happen. But then he was hearing the word of the Lord. This is the way we as Christians need to live our life, is to always be hearing the word of the Lord. Now we do what God wants us to do now and get to the place where God wants us to be, and then God will reveal it in process of time. Not always be revealed all at once. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, took the knife to slay his son, and he says, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. Verse 12. For I know that thou hast fearest God, seeing that thou withholdest not thy son, thine only son, from me. I think this is also interesting, too, is that the side issue, when angels appear before the Lord, they present to you the Lord's message, not their own. Abraham said, Here am I, and then he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do anything, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou withholdest not thy son, thine only son, from me. And the same way that the angel spoke for the Lord, for God, is the same way that the Holy Ghost today speaks for Jesus Christ. It's important to realize that God speaks through the Holy Ghost within us. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered up for him a burnt offering instead of his son. And so here is the important thing, the important symbolism he, he wanted to do here. Not only did he want to show uh, Jesus Christ through this picture on the Temple Mount, but also he wanted to show a replacement. Everybody that has a son, because of our sins, we're essentially on that altar ourselves. When we've sinned, we have to be that sacrifice. We have to pay for our own sin. It is God who's going to slay us because of our sins. We're going to go to hell because of our sins. But we see here that there was a substitution made. And the picture here he wanted to show in faith was that Jesus Christ is going to be the substitution for all of us. The Islamic people, what they say is, oh, at that moment when God was going to slay his son, what he did is actually he switched him and Barabbas around and Barabbas died on that cross and Jesus went off and did his thing. But in reality, no, it was Jesus Christ himself that died on that cross. He didn't get switched. The thing is because he had already switched himself, us for him. See, he is the one, he is the ram that God provided himself for sacrifice. And the thing is that when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were yet ready to be slain, Christ slayed himself for us. And that's the symbol here. Is he says, hold on, Abraham. Just as Jesus Christ now tells us who are saved that we're ready to be sacrificed for the Lord, he says, hold on, that's one of mine. Switch it for the ram. Switch it for myself. That is my child. He is not needed to be sacrificed. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So Jehovah Jireh means it shall be seen, or the Lord will provide. The two are true because the Lord's going to provide it and we're going to see it. And so on Mount Moriah, when God crucified his son, we saw that, and now down through the ages we see that sacrifice as a substitution for ourselves. So no longer do we provide burnt offerings to the Lord because Jesus Christ was our burnt offering. He was our sacrifice on the Temple Mount. And that's what we see here is that God provided a sacrifice for us. And that is what faith tells us is that it is God himself that provided this salvation. We see in John chapter 1 it says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. And so this is that same Lamb, the symbol of that same Lamb. Lay not thy hand upon the Lamb, neither do a thing unto him. The thing is that now that Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for us, there is nothing that's going to be done to us us to kill us. Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. Now that he's the sacrifice, we are no longer in danger of being sacrificed ourselves. Those who claim that we were saved and spared and then say, oh, but if you do wrong deeds, then you can be slain again. They crucify the Lord afresh. That is heathen teaching. That is wrong teaching. There is one sacrifice for all time. Verse 12, we see
see here. And he says, I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And today what people do, what people do in life is they withhold themselves from God. They withhold themselves and say, you can't have me. And so they, in non-belief, say, no, God, you can't have me. And then we, what we know about those type of people is that they'll be slain before the Lord anyway because of their rebellion. The thing is, though, when we come to the Lord in faith and we say, Lord, I'm willing to follow you and I'm taking Jesus Christ as my sacrifice, God sees our faith and just like Abraham says, I know that you fear me now and I'm going to spare you. I'm going to spare your life. I'm going to spare you from your punishment. Verse 14 proves that that was a prophecy. It shall be seen. It's not something that he says, this has been seen or has been provided, but he says it shall be provided. That is a key word for prophecy. When it says it shall be provided, that is a prophecy passage. It says that this is not something that's already been done, but it will be provided in the future. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven a second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, then blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. thing is that the children of Israel today, if they are not obeying the Lord's voice, this blessing doesn't fall on them. They need to obey the voice. The same way it goes with us today is that if we wish to see the blessings of God in our life, we need to hear his voice. We need to follow his voice. And in, in seeing this, that in blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thy seed. He will use us to multiply his nation. If we are doing what the Lord says, uh, our children after us will see the blessings of the Lord in our life and will also follow. You know, raise up a child in the way that he should go, and he will not depart far from thee. And in thy seed shall the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And so we see here the sacrifice that Abraham shown. He gave his only begotten son on the cross with Calvary for us. When God asked him for the ultimate demonstration of love and commitment, he asked for his son. When God the Father wanted to show us his love and commitment to us, he gave us his son. We can say to the Lord, now I know that you love me, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. See, the Lord loves us just as Abraham loved his son, and he provided his son as a sacrifice for us. So we see that, that also when he named the mountain Jehovah Jireh, and the place was significant, Abraham called it Jehovah Jireh, the mount of the Lord shall be seen and it will be provided. Abraham didn't name the place in reference to what he experienced. He didn't name it Mount of Trial or Mount of Agony or Mount of Obedience. Instead, he named it the hill in reference to what God did or would do in the name and Mount Provision. His name is known God would provide the ultimate sacrifice for salvation on that hill one day. As it is said to this day, in verse 14 it says, as it is said to this day, in Moses' day, they knew this prophecy as well. And so this is something that was not just made up by the comparison between Christ and Abraham here. It was not just something that Paul made up, but everybody in Israel knew, even up to Moses' day. The Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said in this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Whenever we see the narrator coming in, that's Moses Moses, that he's explaining that this is something that shall be seen, and then that's the common saying throughout the whole day. So that is the gospel. So we need to realize that the gospel was all the way from Abraham all the way up to Paul, and then he was testifying of that gospel in the Old Testament, and we testify of it today. Isaac's picture of Jesus becomes clearer. Both were loved by the Father. Both were offered themselves willingly. Both carried the wood up the hill. Both were sacrificed on the same hill. And both were delivered from death on the third day. Third day, I want to go back to that one more time. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4, it says he rose again the third day. And then he says, according to the scriptures. And the scriptures that they used was the Old Testament. He rose again the third day. And so we see here, when he got there on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And so he's seeing this place afar off on the third day, and this all happens on that day, on the third day. He didn't actually prepare a sacrifice on the third day. He was told to sacrifice on the first day. He was told, you need to sacrifice on the first day. And then he knew that Isaac was going to be slain on that first day, essentially. And then three days he took to get to this place. And for three days he knew that his son was going to die, and essentially was dead. But the fact is that on that third day, when God said, do not slay the child, and he 
spared him and, and gave a ram, on that third day his child essentially was risen to life again. So we see that as a comparison in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4, that says he rose again the third day according to the scripture. So we see there, Isaac was reckoned dead by Abraham as soon as God gave him the command to, to sacrifice his son. And then Isaac was made alive on this third day later. And so we see that Christ rose again the third day. And it took him three days to get there. And so we see Isaac in that picture. And we're blessed through this picture of Isaac. We're blessed through God's son. I will multiply thy seed as seed of seven. And then the chapter ends with saying, And it came to pass after these things that it was told to Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she hath also borne children to your brother Nahor. And then they give the list of the children. And that's the tie-in, Rebekah. So we'll see that in the future. But the important thing right now is as we go in faith to learn to when we follow the Lord in faith, we do it as he tells us to do it, when he tells us to do it, with the things that we have on hand. We do it in faith, believing every part, even if it seems to contradict. And so that's something that we can really take to the bank and also to realize that Jesus Christ, that sacrifice, was prophesied all the way back in Abraham. This is not something that we made up in Christianity. This is something that was believed from Abraham all the way to Moses, and then from Moses' time all the way to Jesus Christ. This is the prophecy of the Messiah, and as we go on, we're going to learn more about this, that the Old Testament is ultimately, chapter by chapter, a description of faith, a description of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's always been there, and everybody that had faith in God always believed it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for blessing you give to us, Lord. I just pray that you'll continue to guide and bless us and be with us as we go our separate ways and also as we come back tonight for the evening services. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you'll help us grow in faith and understanding. Just I pray. Amen.